Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming to our panel. We're really excited. We have a lot of content to get through, so we're going to get started. Yes. Let's see. Share screen. Okay. Share. Okay. Hell yeah, it worked. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Welcome, gang, to VVB2 Presents, The Boyfriend Theory and Other BL Writing Tactics. <laughs> Hold on. Let me move this. Uh, oh. Here, otherwise. You can minimize it, okay. I think. Oh, I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, hello, everyone. We are VVBG, very, very bad girls, professional BL created duo. Yeah. I'm Ichi, the writer. And I am Archie, the artist. I moved to the camera, even though they can't see us anymore. Oh, same. <laughs> <laughs> Keep reading. Okay. All right, so, we've been making BL professionally since 2018 with multiple series that run a whole gamut of genres. And uh, I get paid for my scripts, and Archia does this as a, her full-time job. We've won awards for our stories, and we also have an illustrated novel, and I have a degree in creative writing. Wow. Yeah, so. I haven't got any degrees. I just like to draw. You have a science degree. Yeah, but that's nothing to do with drawing. You have a science mind. That's nothing to do. Okay, no mind. <laughs> so that's why we're, that's who we are, and today we're going to talk to you about StoryCraft when you're making BL. And on the screen is just the selection of our titles. And so for this PowerPoint, I've just like gotten a bunch of images from this to illustrate our words. I hope you enjoy it. So why do we love BL? Why do we make, we make it? What do readers get out of it? So BL is an expression of universal experiences, longing, and fantasy, romance, and desire, beauty, and fear, love, eroticism, sexuality, and self-discovery. And when you and every BL work centers around these feelings, every one of them, sometimes all of them, sometimes just a few combinations of them. But these are the feelings that we come back to again and again that makes us want to read these stories. Mm -hmm. And with these characters and their conflicts, we discover our own humanity. It's an amazing genre. I love BL. So it's okay to write what you like. So writers in the audience right now, like sometimes people have all these questions about what it is that they can and can't write, can and can't write. And readers sometimes have questions, what is it I can and can't read? Like to, to consume, does it say something? Is it okay to make this if you know, X, Y, Z. Is it okay to do this trope that I've literally seen done a million times before? Is it okay to really love tropes? Because surely, like, tropes, they're so... Like, yeah, they're so cliche. Like, no really one likes to be called cliche. But I really like this trope. Is it okay to make BL? Yes. Spoilers. The answer is yes. If you need permission, we're giving you permission right <laughs> now. And the answer is yes, because your audience loves it too. Um, because making comics is a grind, right? If you write a novel, writing novels is a grind and it's a long-term commitment. And in order to see it through to the end, you have to be making what you love. Uniqueness of an idea doesn't come from the idea or trope itself, but rather the execution of that idea. So you're bringing something to this idea just by you being the creator making this thing. And there's a real beauty that you can bring to a familiar trope by doing it well. Yeah, it could be the same story that you've seen a billion times. But if you really deliver it, I know that I will read that over and over and over again because it's a fantastic feeling. Yes. BL is about giving that satisfaction feeling, the doki doki feeling to your readers. And if what you're making, you're avoiding the things that you really like because you're sort of worried about them, you don't get that feeling, you can't inspire it in your readers. It's your style and your point of view and the things that are specific and personal to you and that you love that you can make your BL unique. No one can tell your story like you can. Your love for the material itself is what makes it unique. So you need to go for it. You need to make it and you should write what you like. It's literally so important there's a, oh, else why do it like yeah. why even do it yeah so what is it that we like so what keeps us reading and what makes us want to see a story through to the end what excites us about bl so michi has come up with this concept that i think is pretty it really helps us explain our own stories 
Yeah, yeah, actually. And stories I, that we like. I think after I came up with this concept, I'm like, wow, I'm going to get better at this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just her first exploration of this idea, but I yeah. hope you liked it. Yeah, the, the tenets of Biel can be defined in two words. It's about yearning and satisfaction. If you hit these two things, you will like the BL. If you are making it, if you hit these things, your readers will like the BL that you're making. Yeah, these are the two things that you have to keep in mind when you're driving your story. So yearning is desire and longing and sexual and romantic tension. It's everything that the audience is feeling when they search for satisfaction. It's that strong emotion that you get that's like, that's painful and almost painful, but yet also delicious and beautiful. Yeah, it's like the gap. Yes, that's the gap. A sort of metaphorical gap, but you want to bridge that gap. It's the yearning. Yeah, and that's literally why people ship things. <laughs> they ship things because of yearning, because you're like, oh my God, I need to see them get together. I need to bridge the gap. It's like a potential energy and it builds and it builds and it builds. Oh, potential energy. I love that. Okay. It's nice. physics. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfaction is the point. It's the end goal of the story. It's the fulfillment of the desire brought on by the yearning. It's the happy ending. It's the love confession. The needs are satisfied. And once you get satisfaction, the story is over. So it's your end goal. All right. Depending if you could write writing a short story or a long story, we still want to end with that satisfaction fulfillment of everything. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about short stories and long stories. Yeah, we're just setting things up, guys. Just right. you wait. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna make them yearn. <laughs> So we always begin with our protagonist in the beginning of the story um, that, or the MC, and he's missing something in his life. It's maybe it's love uh, because it's BL usually is love. Perhaps it's self-knowledge and maybe he's longing for love. Maybe he doesn't know he's missing it or maybe he's completely given up on it. But when we produce, introduce the potential love interest the often known as uh, in the inciting incident in Storycraft, but the potential love interest is what sets the whole story in motion. And they, that's when the yearning begins for the character and the reader. Yeah, they have the character and the reader and the main character and the reader need to be on the, not the same page, but they need to be going on a, sim a similar journey as they go through the narrative. Yeah. So in the beginning, we have MC at ground zero living his daily life. He's missing something. He doesn't know he's missing something, or maybe he feels like something is off, but there's something missing. And at the end of the story, the MC is fulfilled, having found love and or discovered something about himself. And in that gap between lacking something and satisfaction and fulfillment, that's where yearning happens. Yearning is everything that happens in between, in that gap, and it's what drives the story forward. So what is satisfaction not? Satisfaction isn't just instant gratification. It's not the same. This is going to be hurting for you readers, but you got to listen to me. It's not the same as reader gratification. Gratification is giving the readers exactly what they want when they ask for it. And I'm sure creators in the audience will see comments in, on their properties like, oh, I want to see X happen. Oh, I, really, I wish why, Y would happen. Why can't they just talk to each other? Right. Why? I just want him to be nice to him. I just want him to give him a hug. Right. I'm really mad. I want this to happen. I want that to happen. What you need to remember as a creator, you need to be strong and you need to understand that you have soaked up a beautiful yearning in your readers. This, these comments telling, telling you to do this, that, or the other, they're expressing their yearning. Yeah. Yeah, I see a lot of creators sometimes get frustrated by these comments. And what you should see them as instead is a sign that you're doing your job. Because the reader's desires will often be ahead of the desires of the characters. And they want to see emotional developments happen before the characters are ready for them. But that's how it's supposed to be, because the reader has to want that, because that's what's going to keep them reading. Yes. Satisfaction, the end goal, is hard one. The feeling of having, having gone through something with the character, of having struggled and yearned and desired and overcome, that's what creates a beautiful satisfaction. Satisfaction is the point of the story. And again, once it's achieved, then the story is over. So 
how do we create real characters to make these stories? Yeah, because the, the audience doesn't yearn for the character until they can really connect with them. So we're going to try and, this is very abbreviated, we're going to try and give you some tips. Okay, so sometimes what you might see in BL uh, is that the characters' identities are reliant on each other and like they are completely dependent on their relationship to each other. And that's when it feels less realistic. It's so it's like they're actors in a role rather than characters living in the world. Right, so you don't want two characters who are only defined by one another. Like over here, like I'm MC or I have a crush on my best friend. It's like, hi, I'm MC's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm MC, I'm an innocent businessman. <laughs> and I am MC's boss, and I am a perverted businessman. Right. <laughs> These are some characters where their whole like sense of who they are is completely defined by who they are opposite in the romantic story. And it's like tropes like this can sometimes be fine for your one shot stories. Like I, I love reading one shots actually, and because in that, in those stories, the satisfaction point is going to be reached by the end of the chapter, which is nice. Yeah, yeah because there's. There's the two characters. We know who they are. They're two best friends, or their uh, boss and his supportive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they meet, and there's a desire, a yearning. They have sex, and then the sex is the satisfaction. The story ends after that point because the satisfaction has been achieved. But you still get all those feelings because the characters were presented in such a way that created a desire in the reader. And there's an intent, you can feel the yearning, the intense desire for each other, even if that only happens within like three pages. Yeah. Because like, oh my God, they're so hot. I really want to see them do it. <laughs> and sometimes if you make um, a story like this, you'll, and you, the characters are completely dependent on each other in terms of their characterization, you'll find people saying, oh, these guys, they're a bit one dimensional. Like I didn't really get them, that kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying archetypes that you might want to use in your stories. But if you want the characters to feel complex and real, you should see these archetypes more of, uh, as jumping off points than yeah. goals. Yeah, so like that's kind of your idea when you first start your story. Like, I really want to write a best friend type story. I really want to write a business type story. Right. These but, but that's only the beginning. That's okay. only the beginning. Right. You got to keep going. Yes. Delve a little deeper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what he said. Okay. <laughs> so... When the character is all on their own, they must feel unique, even if he's not with his best friend or his <laughs> boss, <laughs> which are apparently the two genres. <laughs> These are just some examples, some common examples. Okay, well, when you flesh out the character and you give them details that ground them to their real world, you'll make them human and therefore more relatable to your reader. Yeah. Um, you guys have probably seen those OC memes that get passed around. They've been getting passed around since like the hotmail days, like email chain litter days, where it's like, oh, there's like, oh, tell us about your OC. What are all the, fill out all these random details. Like what's his eye color? What's his Starbucks drink? What's his favorite color? What band does he like to listen to? And when I was very young, I always had a lot of trouble with these sort of OC surveys. Because so I thought I was like, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at character creation because I wasn't good at coming up with these random details. And I didn't know what made a character unique or not. I was like, oh, maybe I'll just pick a bunch of random answers and make him crazy and random <laughs> okay. and not make a unique character. <laughs> so some people, I think the mistake there is they think details that are real for just plain details, like favorite color, Starbucks order, favorite movie. This is a, These are all things that can be randomized because it's just surface stuff. It's nice, but it doesn't tell you about who the character is as a person. And what you want to do is get to the core of the character. Yeah, if you want to make a character really a character, not just a, an archetype, you need to really uh, pers personify them. So uh, we've got some ideas you can ask yourself when you're creating a character. These are a lot more like real and could potentially have like harsher answers than some detailed questions. But I think they're really good to at least think about when it comes to making a character real. Yeah, so you want, th I, you want to think about things like what is their background? Where do they come from? What's their family life like? What's their relationship to their parents? 
Was their life like now? How did they get here? How did they get this job? Or how did they get to the school? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are they rich or poor? How were they raised? Have they ever been in a relationship before? Have they had many relationships? Yeah. Um, because these are the themes that inform real people as well as and it's how real people look at life. A lot of the way that we interact with the world is because of our backgrounds and how we were raised and where we are from and what we're used to and our experiences, our romantic experience. Yes. And the more you delve into their psychology, the more you know about them and the more you realize why it is that they behave the way that they do. Which is really excellent for story writing when you've got like a consistent character. So what you want to get into is what drives their decisions when they're confronted with a problem. Um, and the driving of course, force, of course, is what are they missing? The missing something that the story is about. The need for love or self-fulfillment, whether he realizes it or not. And once you have a really good core of character, like you have a good idea of who they are, like the surface details, like favorite color or whatever, can be filled in later. And they, Starbucks order. <laughs> Starbucks order. <laughs> if they can even afford Starbucks, or if yeah. Starbucks is nothing to them because they're yeah, so rich. <laughs> or, or they, or they, they're a coffee snob. Right. <laughs> the details can be filled in later, and they'll come to you. This is what we've found anyway. As you write them, and, and before you know it, the characters are making decisions all on their own. Yeah. And that's what people mean when they say after a certain point, the characters write themselves. Yeah, something, a big thing I learned at the writing process, and sometimes what I see stops people from just starting their story, is they think they have to have it all figured out before they start. And you don't, you need the core character, because then you'll find that um, you'll be writing and be like, oh, I think they would do this, I think they would do that, because you know them that well. And that informs something. It's like, yes. like, oh, I think I'm going to give him siblings. And that informs something. Something later down the line. Yeah, exactly. Like so these things can, it's an ongoing process. So the romantic interest. This is very important in BL, extremely important. Romantic interest to the MC. Yeah. So what you have to understand about BL readers, as you probably all know, they are high volume consumers and passionate fans of the genre. They know their tropes, they love them, they can recognize tropes right away. They're collectively, they're a very smart audience and very observant. And they want to experience the universal pleasures again and again in different variations in different ways. So there's nothing wrong with playing to trope because you have, sometimes people are so focused on like, oh, I don't want it to be cl cliche. I want to make a unique story that they try it, to- It won't be cliche if you make it yours. Yeah. And the other thing is if they, if you try to just throw away tropes just because you're afraid of making it cliche, sometimes what you end up with is a very unsatisfying story. Right. Okay, so now this is where boyfriend theory comes to play. The name of this panel. <laughs> I have boyfriend theory because I actually came up with it. <laughs> well, I was just trying to uh, sort of um, understand why it is that readers recognize or misrecognize characters in a story as the air quotes boyfriend of the MC. And so I was trying to sort of categorize, like sort of formalize it. Okay, so how can I make this work for me so that they always know who the boyfriend is, even if there are a bunch of boys? Or if you're writing multi ship, they know who the potential love interests are or the eventual boyfriends are, kind of a thing. So yeah. this is my this is my theory. <laughs> Readers want to ship. And they want to feel that yearning feeling. They want to know who the boyfriend is because they want to be loyal to him. Because otherwise, how can they go along this narrative journey with the MC of romance and yearning if they don't feel the desire of getting the MC together with the love interest? So, <laughs> and this come, I I thought I noticed this because it happened in a few in one I remember of my comics where um, people were searching for the boyfriend because he hadn't shown up yeah and i noticed it in the comic that i was actively reading and watching the reader watching the reader reactions yeah yeah they're so. looking they're looking for the boyfriend they want the boyfriend so readers will as they read the story latch on to the first vaguely hot male that's presented to them so they can start shipping the mc and they can start enjoying the yearn so unless you obviously show and i'm going to tell you how who the boyfriend's going to be your MC is going to be open season for any vaguely hot male character you have in your story, which, 
you know, maybe you want that that feel, but like <laughs> you have to know that's what's happening. You have to be aware I, of that. I have happening. seen creators be like, why don't they understand what's happening? Yeah. Why don't they understand that the boyfriend hasn't shown up yet? I, I I've I've thought those things too. When I when my readers were telling me these things, I was like, why are they thinking that? This doesn't make I didn't write that, but they don't know what I have written because they, they haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. So it's important to be aware of this. And that's why we're talking about boyfriend theory. <laughs> so this is this is my comic Miles of Painted Darkness. I did stop making it because um, I was writing a novel at the same time and the worlds went out of joint. So this is I left it up on tap if you want to read it. It's just a couple, it's like a chapter or two before I stopped it. But what happened was the main character, Lucky, um, in this in the whole bit I drew, he never meets boyfriend so boyfriend doesn't happen in this yeah, the main love interest never appears she He's never not, got to that point I didn't get to that point <laughs> <laughs> okay I was nervous leave me alone so what happened, <laughs> what happened was like as people were reading page to page they were looking for the boyfriend and the second this guy appeared uh this guy, he's an art chick. He showed up and they were like, oh, I think this is the boyfriend. Like I saw it happen. They're like, like, oh my God, he's gonna save Lucky. They're gonna get together. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm so excited. Right, and like there were a few other boys before, but because they weren't that handsome, I don't think they latched on to him because this guy, you know. Vaguely he, attractive. He's vaguely hot. Vaguely hot male character. So like, okay, I guess it's gonna be Lucky and this guy. But then um, the next episode, he, he shoots Lucky. So like, that wasn't the case. It was my yeah. fault. I shouldn't have made him that handsome or I should have done something else to de-boyfriendize him. Yeah, no, no, no. This is really funny because I saw the exact same thing happen in a different comic. And what it is is that the readers are looking for the boyfriend and they want to be loyal to him because they want to ship and they want to yearn along with the MC. Which, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So what happens, the only way to break it is if the, the what they thought was the boyfriend does something completely unforgivable. Right. Yeah. Which happened in the story you were enjoying too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He did something. He he said something homophobic, and he was what? Well, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. And then he wasn't the boyfriend no. anymore. Yeah. I've also seen readers defend false boyfriends because they thought they were they were they thought that it was going to be the main love interest. Right. And even when the false boyfriend does like abusive things, like oh no no no, but we're gonna forgive him because the real boyfriend hadn't shown up yet. Yeah. So you do need to be aware of that when you're plotting your story and you're pacing it. You need to make sure that you are um, where the potential love interest are and where your actual love interest is, so you have control over that situation. So how do we denote the boyfriend? We have to give him a boyfriend entrance, and this is when the boyfriend is first introduced. Here's some things that you want in the boyfriend entrance. You want your MC to be affected by his attractiveness, whether it's conscious or not. If you're writing a novel, you can also do this in text. He's described in such a way that is delightful and appealing to the reader. Even if it's like a dark character, there it's fun to hear the description. Yeah, he has boyfriend characteristics. Maybe he's particularly powerful, particularly dominant, particularly sexy, or maybe he's especially beautiful. He's alluring, he's special. He's different, yeah. He's different. And this is the important one. Uh, the boyfriend should be hotter than all the other potential love interests. Unless you wanna do some sort of multi-ship thing, uh, then you can do like equally hot guys, but you need to have the hot one be the boyfriend. Like, However, you can still give the true love interest a boyfriend entrance if you're doing a multi-ship. Yeah, so if you have a mul if you have multiple guys that potentially are going after MC, you But wanna, you still want the readers on the same page as you? If you want the readers on the same page as you, the writer, which does help when it comes to crafting things, you want to make sure that the true love interest gets the boyfriend entrance. Yeah. And if you have multiple love interests and you want them all viable options, they should all be given equal importance. So they all have to get boyfriend entrances. Yes. However, be aware that many fans will still want to be loyal to the boyfriend that they saw first. So if you do have multiple boyfriends, you need to make sure that the, the, the one you show first is going to be the one that they latch on to first. So you need to be aware of that when you're writing your story. Yeah. Okay. Like Edward and Jacob. Like the word boyfriend is becoming like close <laughs> to my ear right now, just so you know. I don't know what it means anymore. <laughs> okay. So... Okay, then there's also your second chance for a boyfriend entrance. Uh, sometimes there's romances where the boyfriend is a character who's been there the whole time, but MC has a realization that he's hot and starts seeing him in a new light. 
and uh, we call this the jump in the lake moment because right. of Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> the Pride and Prejudice TV series of Colin Firth when he jumps in the lake and he walks over to Elizabeth Bennet and she's like sort of, oh, he's handsome. And I was also like, oh, he's so handsome. So yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> it's also like in the 90s high school movie when she descends the stairs in her prom dress and all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, she's so hot. Right. I never thought of her in a romantic way before, but now she's so gorgeous. His character's been there the whole time, but they're now getting their boyfriend entrance. So it's a moment of transformation or metamorphosis. And this is your second chance to do your boyfriend entrance. Someone who's previously unattractive suddenly becomes a potential love interest. It's this is very satisfying for the audience when you pull it off because they actually start seeing this character in a new light along with the MC. And the ones who were shipping them all along feel really validated it's and really, they love and they love it. They're like they start screaming, your comments are full of like, ah, I knew it. Yeah, you're I giving it. you're giving them so much joy. You're doing a wonderful thing. Yeah, so it's enjoyable for both audiences. Okay, so how do we keep tension in our romance stories? In order to keep reader interest, there have to be uncertainties. So you'll need conflicts, both external and internal, to get in the way of the potential romance. So we've got two different categories of romances. The slow burn and the fast burn. <laughs> right. And they can both they both will give you the same, like you ideally you still want yearning all the way through both of these types of stories. Because that's what drives the story. Yes. Even a fast burn and a slow burn. Slow burn, it's, it seems more obvious, right? So yeah, slow burn romance is obviously the romance built slowly. It's all about yearning. The audience keeps reading because they're dying for the satisfaction. The yearning is both physical and emotional. And we want to see that first kiss. We want to see the development of their relationship. We want to see them finally have sex. Um, <clears throat> when you're doing a slow burn along the way, the characters must continuously make progress in their relationship and in themselves so that they can finally be together. If the characters aren't changing in this slow burn story, then people feel like there was no reason for you to draw it out. They might say that it's pointless, that they might give it up because after 20 chapters, nothing has changed. The characters are no closer to getting together than they were at chapter one, and the characters haven't changed. And change can be subtle. It can be the realization of desire, growing closer in their relationship, they're denying their own feelings, and the audience is realizing the growing emotions of what the character does, which creates, you know, yearning. that delicious feeling. It's like, come on, guys. Oh my God, he's he doesn't know, but he's so in love with him already. Yeah, all good stuff. And fast burn romance. The characters are immediately attracted to each other and have sex right away. The feeling of yearning is created through the fact that their emotions have not developed to a point where they have fallen in love. So the yearning is not physical, but emotional. And what we want is to see them fall in love. So there always has to be a gap in order for readers to continue to seek satisfaction. Yeah, the sex that they have can't be the um, uh, can't be both an emotional and physical realization because that's satisfaction. It's going to be they're at the beginning of their journey. They've had sex, but in terms of the story, they're still right at the beginning of their journey. So opening with the sex scene <laughs> both slow burn stories and fast burn stories can open with a sex scene it's a common method to hook the reader to let them know that sex will happen oh my gosh okay we'll get faster <laughs> we'll burn faster <laughs> if, so if you're doing a plot based story you, this can be a flash forward to keep um readers with you on the long journey you're about to show them um, but however, if you open with a sex scene, you have to be aware you're giving the expectation that this will be a sexy story and pr it probably will have many sex scenes scattered throughout because yeah. that's because if you show a sex scene and then nothing for 50 chapters, I think people will be confused. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to make sure when you're starting your story that you're starting it and the way that you mean for the majority of it to continue. Yeah. If you show um, MC having sex with the boyfriend, for some readers, this can ruin the yearning. So you have to make sure you create it with the emotional gap. Yes. And what? And there's some sexy comics that I've read, and you're there gonna be a lot of sex scenes throughout. And one solution is to show the MC having sex with someone who's not the main love interest. But you have to be careful that the readers don't mistake this person for the boyfriend. Which is why every time you've seen it, if you've read these comics like on Lezine, the person that they sleep with is often anonymous, 
bland face. You don't see his face, like just a torso or shown to be obvious nobody. Like, like he just says something shitty and then leaves. Right. <laughs> so how do you keep the tension between the two of them after they've had sex? Um, so in order for it to happen, it in order for yearning to happen, sex can't be the resolution of the tension. So what sort of things can we do to keep the tension in place? Unresolved misunderstandings, denial of feelings. Is there an untold secret that keeps them apart? Is it the first, the first time they have sex after a long time apart? Or is the sex to say goodbye before they separate? Oh, that feels very longing to it me. It does, I'm feeling yearning already. <laughs> Uh, but the problem that causes the conflict in their relationship is still unresolved. The problem can be external, like forbidden romance, unable to be together, forces that keep them apart, or it can be internal, which is character flaws or lack of growth in the characters. Yes. Lack of realization. Yes. And, and then, so once they have sex, you can also, this is actually a very common romance beat, is to have the characters backslide in their relationship because the thing that kept them apart in the beginning once again rears its ugly head. And these are problems that you can deal with along the story and you have to deal with them in the satisfying way before the satisfying point can be reached because readers need to know this is resolved. Yeah. So reader reaction is a result of yearning. If you are doing the tension right, the readers will squirm and yearn and tell you they want to see all manner of emotional things. Don't give in, stay strong and stay the course. <laughs> if you give in before the characters are ready, this will ruin the yearning feeling and your audience will lose interest because they got what they wanted. They'll still feel a bit unsatisfied because it didn't happen along the journey that you planned. And then when they're like, oh, why'd you drop this comic? The response will be, it got boring. It got boring because you didn't follow your story structure. So you do need to stay. Yeah, because you were so tempted. You're just like, oh my God, I've been working on this a long time. I want to show them. And like, and the reader's like, yeah, show us. They don't know what they want. Okay, this is what you need to understand. They don't know what they want. Okay, they think they do, but they don't know what they want. They want to yearn. That's, that's, that's the secret. They do. They actually want to yearn. Yeah. Okay, so you want to make sure that you have a protagonist driven plot. In any plot, uh, events shouldn't happen by coincidence. Coincidence can be how your two characters meet. Like, I just had a random hookup and the next day I found out he's my new boss. Right. <laughs> but after that moment, you get one, okay? You get one gimme. And <laughs> after that, the story has to be driven by the characters and their desires. If everything happens only by coincidence, the story feels random, the universe has no meaning, and the end result is unsatisfying. You can present difficult situations, but the story has to resolve on how your MC reacts to them and what choices he makes. Choosing not to do anything is also a choice, but it has to come from the character and has to make sense in line with who he is and what he believes. Like, is he an action taker or someone who's too afraid to take action? These are both choices. Yeah, yeah. things can happen to your protagonist, which is out of his control. I'm an Omega and I've been sold off to this handsome man. Oh no. <laughs> but in order to make it interesting, he has to be emotionally active so the reader can experience the world through his eyes. This can be, this can be very satisfying, create lots of yearning for your readers if you do it right. All right, so pacing. Here's just a picture of some of my storyboards. I, I storyboard up whole seasons before I start drawing them for this reason, which is correct pacing. So you've got to write everything down before you start drawing. And once you draw, you've got to do storyboards first and read it through, feel the rhythm, you know, feel the beats, try and see it from the reader's point of view when they don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah, actions share cause and effect. Choices have consequences. Yes. This is something we say to each other all the time. <laughs> yes, that way that everything will have weight to it. Yeah, so your storyboards on your, your plotting, it doesn't have to be perfectly polished. Like once again, you still, you will find yourself changing scenes, inserting scenes, and during the process of actually making the story, but you do have to make a roadmap in order to pace properly. Stories feel well paced when things flow in an order that makes sense and you'll see moments for tension and breaks in tension. It's, you'll know when you, it's hard to explain, but you'll know when you read it, you do have to plan it to experience it yourself so you know that you're on the right track. All right, so then we gotta, after you've paced, after we've written it out, we gotta stick the landing, make the ending good, deliver yeah, the we, satisfaction. We love a sticky landing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you, so, 
the story isn't over until it's over, right? And satisfaction is achieved by the things you planted in the plot coming to fruition. Not every question has to be resolved, but the main conflicts, keeping the main characters apart, need to be dealt with. If the problem can't be solved, there, the problem has to be acknowledged and the characters make a commitment to be together in spite of it. And the ultimate sex is the happy ever after sex. When the characters have come to their emotional resolutions, they're now on the same page, they're in harmony, and they're fulfilling each other as only they can. So MC finds what he was missing at the beginning of the story. The characters have changed. His wants are fulfilled. Love is found. Satisfaction. It's truly the greatest gift you can give your readers. And it's worth working towards. And it takes time, but it's, yeah, you want to get to this point. To, to get, to earn the happy ending, you have to have correctly built the story preceding it. Yeah, otherwise you, you get there and like, oh, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so here are some other considerations. We're going to try to keep it we're, we're going to try to keep this brief because I want to leave some time for your questions. I think these are some really good considerations. Are they really good considerations? So I think you should talk about them. We <laughs> need to, Kim. We need to talk about them. Yeah. All right. So first thing is cover design. So how does cover design affect how your readers will read your story? Um, there's a term that's called positioning. <laughs> it's, it's actually used in the film industry and what it means is prepping the audience for what's to come basically you're setting the expectations for the audience uh, and f finding your readers and your fans and this is an actually important so you what you want to do with your cover and a lot of people say oh all bl covers are the same but it's not true and the reason why we have to show it's a bl is so you can reach your readers and avoid readers that don't want to read a BL. Yes. So you want to you want to show it's a BL. You want to show your MC plus the boyfriend if you want to correct if you want the readers to correctly ship. Yes. What you want plan for them to ship. And if there are multiple love interests, you can show that. Yes. So they have to be displayed as equal love interests in the cover. Yeah. Well, so one thing that we can talk about is like so for example, my friend was is making a very popular comic. And what happens is that the main love interest actually appears later and the main character hooks up with a different love interest first. A false love interest. A false love interest. Who's on the cover. But he's on the cover. So when the main love interest finally appeared and they hooked up and they're together, the readers were like, oh no, I'm just going to get my heart broken because I know he's going to go back to that asshole. And she's like, why? Why? I'm showing that they're working. I'm sure it's working. I'm like, the dude's still on the cover. When she updated the cover to show the two love interests, now the readers were reacting the right way. They're like, oh no, which one is he going to end up with? And that's the reaction that she wanted. And something, so by doing this, you're setting the reader's expectations, which is a good thing. Because if readers go into your story expecting something different, they will get mad and be disappointed. If they go into the story knowing what to expect, they'll be really excited to start yearning. So yes, cover design is something to be taken into account. So how do you censor your comic for posting? Yeah, this is something I'm just going to touch on briefly. Is, so you have to decide what to show versus what not to show. Censorship currently is the bane of the BL <laughs> creator's existence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you could do, there's, there's lightsabers, versus creative hiding. We uh, we always prefer a creative frame. I prefer creative frame. Until lightsabers. Lightsabers kind of make me laugh. <laughs> Plus on webtoons, lightsabers and pixelation are not allowed. Yeah, so creative hiding is better. Yeah, but even I think even on webtoons, sometimes creative hiding is like too much. Yeah, because yeah. They'll, just, they'll define adult yeah. content differently. Yeah, Tapas allows creative hiding though. So you want to be very careful about what you show and what you don't show um, to get away with it. And you want to, um, if you really want to do something that doesn't, isn't censored, I would recommend posting it elsewhere. So post everything that you can on the free sites like Web Webtoon and Tapas, but have, for example, like a Patreon or a Ko-fi where you can like post the legit stuff um, and have pe funnel people over from the free sites to the legit stuff. And that way you can get around um, censoring. Okay. And the other thing is dialogue. It so dialogue, is, oh, well, writing dialogue, if your story is structured, uh, structured correctly, dialogue is kind of the icing on the cake. But dialogue is a very useful tool because it should always serve two purposes. 
We've lost our notes. <laughs> I had it in order. <laughs> but anyway, oh, here you go. <laughs> anyway, if you've done your character work correctly, um, unique characters will have unique voices. They shows their it shows their age, the location where they grew up, the time period in which they grew up by the phrases that they use. It shows their background, shows their education. And the other thing is that dialogue should always serve the purpose to drive the story forward. You might have to give dialogues a couple of passes because there's the text of what the character is actually meaning, and then there's what they're actually saying. And it's really hard to nail that on the first try. I always give dialogue several passes. Yeah, you want it to be doing a few things at the same time. Yeah, so it's like the, the struggle of dialogue is that it has to be meaningful, has to have emotion, has to drive the story forward, and also has to sound natural. Yes. So this, also, this always takes a few passes. I will write out what, what I'm meaning at the barest level and then you know sort of complicate it the more I go through it. Um, and just a character and story building, think of it as an ongoing process of creation. And also dialogue can make a censored sex scene very, very steamy. So <laughs> don't be afraid to write what you like. Right. <laughs> All right, and now secondary genres we're talking about. So, so there's straightforward like slice of life BL um, and then there's secondary genres like action, horror, fantasy, historical, sci-fi, which is obviously the stuff that Archie and I love to create. Yeah, we like secondary genres. And what you need to remember is that um, the more wide the appeal of, of a genre, the more readers you will get. So if you have a slice of life BL, you're appealing to a much wider range of people than if you're writing a horror BL. So you have to remember that when you're making your story and, and posting it because you don't want to set yourself up for anything. Like, why, disappointment. why am I getting this, that, and the other? It's like, well, you have a more niche if story you, and you need to be aware of that. Yeah, because on every website, if you look at the more the most popular BLs, they're always slice of life. It's because it's the most relatable. Yeah, so the biggest I get range it. of audience. I get it. And there, <laughs> and also it's the easiest to draw because schools and offices, as opposed to sci-fi and space. Well, not necessarily. I wouldn't call anything easier or less. I know. Easier. There are more assets. There are more like assets. There are more assets. Slice not necessarily yeah. easy because there are some very beautifully drawn slice of life. Yes. But yeah, um, it. But the thing is, when you make a niche feel and you find that audience, they're really, really passionate. They're super, super grateful. So the more specific your genre is, the more niche it is, the, your potential audience narrows, but the readers are so grateful you made this. Cause, Cause, yeah, because you're, you're making something that not many people like, but the people that like it really like that it exists. So some, there's someone out there that's hoping that you would make this story for them. So make what you like. Yeah, so you can meet people who are like you. And founding world building. So you're going to make a world for your characters to populate, or are they just floating in white space? This, uh, this is actually rings true for slice of life. It's not just for sci-fi or fantasy or horror. Yeah, you want to have a, if you're making a slice of life, make it like in a place, not just in like generic place, like place it in a city, you know, or like a place that you visited or, or an experience you've had. Yeah, in because it really adds a richness and like a feeling of depth to your stories. It's more, it feels more emotionally resonant. Um, it, so th and the world of the story will feel lived in when it's internally consistent. The world makes sense when it follows its own rules. People say it's unrealistic or filled with plot holes if you break the rules that you set up. <laughs> <laughs> and it, another thing, it doesn't have to be figured out in the beginning. You can start small and you don't need to think too huge. And that's what makes world building intimidating for a lot of people. But the more narrow your focus, the better you will know it. I actually really like stories that are set in a really complicated world, but it's in a very narrow sliver of that world. I love those kind of yeah, stories. Yeah, well, for example, you can have a story set in wartime, yeah. but but your main character doesn't know and it doesn't need to know the politics of everything of anything that's going you're on telling something you're telling me stuff about in that world yeah because you could have a story set in wartime but he lives in a cottage in the countryside right and the war is going on around him oh, that's very ghibli yeah but you have to but you have to know that cottage you have to know what that character's daily life is like and then if you know those details everything else you can build on that yes yeah, so you can always build outwards. Okay, so we, our last point that we want to make is to hammer home something that we said near the beginning, which is that it's okay to write what you like. Okay, because satisfaction is the point of BL. And it's, it's not just, it's satisfaction, it's all these feelings, it's romance and love and exploration and knowing yourself. 
And Beale touches upon universal experiences and beautiful emotions that we want to revisit again and again. With a well-told story, you can touch an audience and help them explore their humanity. You are giving people beautiful experiences. So don't be afraid to write the experiences that speak to you. Because they'll speak to someone else too. All right, now question time. So we'll take any questions about um, how to write BL or how to- um, start, Stop sharing. Yeah, how to, how to make it, how to, um, yeah, any questions we will answer. And if you don't have any questions, we can totally revisit any of these points because I know we were speeding towards the end. So whatever people are interested in, we will answer. See, we have a question for advice. What advice would you give for writing satisfaction in a very plot heavy BL? Mm, because satisfaction, because it's going to be taking a while to get to the satisfaction. And so you want to make sure you're tying up all your loose ends along the way. Yeah. So when if you're doing a plot heavy BL, you two things need to resolve. You need to resolve your plot and you need to resolve your romance. And I'm writing a very plot. We are both writing. We are writing plot heavy BL. <laughs> and what we often, what we sometimes do is when I sketch it out, I will do plot beats and romance beats. And if both are equally important, like you, some people make the romance a subplot and then it gets less screen time. But for me, it's equally important. I think the action is just as important as the developing relationship. And I color code it and I'll like, or you can move things around, yes. but you, I always intersperse plot beats with romance beats. And sometimes you can, you'll you start seeing, you have scenes where you can do more than one thing at the same time. Yes, so you can start building that yearning into a scene that it might be a, be a plot scene, but you're building the romance yearning into that scene. So you're sort of ribboning the two together yeah. and that helps um, you build the yearning for your satisfaction point. You can also resolve many things along the way so people know they're heading in the right direction. Or if you want things to go really bad, you can have something disastrous happen and people are like, oh no, because then they're really wanting to get things right again. So there are multiple ways you can sort it out. Plot heavy, I like that you're doing that. I love plot heavy VL. Yeah, that's what, that's what we like I to hope, make. I hope those tips help. I have a couple related questions. There's one, how do you get started? But similarly, how do you get over writer's block? So how do you get started in the beginning and how do you get over like blocks in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've always found a confession. We've always found when we've had bad writer's block, it, like, it's like very awful, we can't do anything writer's block. It's because there's something wrong with our outline and we need to be very humble and honest with ourselves about our, the quality of our outline and where we might have, you know, gone wrong and somewhere in the story. Yeah, the, the things that help writers block too, the other thing is going back to the basics, yes. studying story craft, because knowing theory helps you make sure, it's like, oh, is this, am I on the right track? Yes. Or, or am I just totally like going off into the woods and wandering away somewhere? <laughs> if you have no idea where you're going, definitely like look at stories you're inspired by and try and like sort of work out from those feelings backwards to how you can implement similar ideas in your stories. If you're having very hard writer's block, look again at your outline. Be like, okay, maybe it was a bit blurry here in my outline. Let me sort of zoom in, like open your yeah, document. focus in. And focus on that part of your outline and write it out as like a sort of extended outline of that section. And that will should help you find what you're going for in that scene. Yeah. yeah, so here's a big thing about writing big things. It's so intimidating. And one person just can't hold it all in their head. The more narrow your focus, the more you know it and the better it'll, it'll feel. The other thing about writer's block is sometimes it happens to us when the creative well is empty. Yes. So learning we to recognize- We call it input and output. So when we're in output <laughs> mode, we're just making stuff and yeah. we're loving it. But when we're in input mode, we get writer's block. What it means is that we have to like look for things that inspire us, like go to a museum or watch a, a move, new movie that really inspires you, read books. Read BL. <laughs> read BL, consume. And then once you've filled up your input, then you can output again. I know that's a really rude way of describing it, but it's genuinely helped us. Oh, oh, what helps me too is music. Like I'm having trouble with like drawing a scene in like an emotive way. I'll put on music of a similar emotion and that really helps me sort of do shots and things like that in comics. Yeah, since I started doing comics, I really study like manga that I love. I was like, no, cause I've read it the, when I, when I read manga, I read it the first time. The first time is to have, just have the emotional experience. And then the second time I read it, I'm looking at the shots. What do the character faces look like? How do they show this? What do they choose to show? Um, I'm looking at like, how are these emotions played out? What happens? Yes. Yeah. 
And like, why, why do I love this? Yeah, yeah. I hope that helps. What comes first for you guys, characters or the plot? Characters. I think it's, yeah, it's the characters. idea of the characters. Always. Yeah. Plot should be character. -driven. I guess characters in a situation. Characters in a situation. Characters in a situation. And the plot oh. sort of unfolds from that. But like, it always starts with the characters. Yeah, because you have to love the characters. Well, for us, people have different ways of writing. But for us, it's characters. Yeah, characters. But then the situation is so enticing. <laughs> How do they get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> How long on average does it take you to write your story from beginning to end? I imagine this will vary and depending on the type of story though. Yeah, well, the pace depends, I think, on um, deadlines. It's external for us. So a lot of our writing, I mean, our novel, we're writing on our own time, but our uh, but like then professional then it stuff- taking the ages. Professional stuff- it Takes a long time. It's guided by, that we have to sort of prioritize based on deadlines. So I don't think we can have a, accurate answer to that question yeah i know a long time <laughs> <laughs> i did i did see that someone asked about thick as thieves i'm still writing it we had some issues with the artist it's still in production but we're hoping to come back this year yeah, yeah. so hard. i'm like i so normally the outline will come right in the beginning of the season i actually had this whole story outline written like two years ago yeah but actually writing each individual chapter each individual event each beat it's still ongoing mm -hmm. so it's like it's a process it's also a super long story as well, so. Yeah, okay. I didn't think it would be. I know you mentioned uh, you don't have to avoid tropes and you talked about embracing them and working with them, but someone asked, what are some tips to avoid falling into tropes though? Okay, so in order to avoid tropes, you need to know them and you need to know why people love them. That's, That's the best advice I can give to you. Instead of, because otherwise you'll just be avoiding things that you don't quite and understand. And you won't know why you're avoiding them. I like going on like TV tropes and like looking at all the related works to a trope that I'm yeah. thinking about. Because you can see the different ways people have executed the exact same trope and how amazing yeah. the stories end up being. If you're choosing to go in a different direction, just it has to be for a reason, not yeah. just because I want to be different from everybody else. It has to be, our, It has. you have to have a point because there are experiments of people that, that do this, and I, and I do love it when it's pulled off. You're, you're subverting expectations, but everything you subvert needs to be for a reason in the story that still delivers on the satisfaction. Yeah, because it is hard. What you will be doing by subverting things, it's harder to create the yearning. Yes. And then you can you can also choose to subvert one trope, but have other things come to fruition, yeah. and that still brings the satisfaction. Yeah, that can be yeah, kind of cool. But, yeah. but it is it is more difficult to do because it has to be done purposefully. Otherwise, people will be like, "This is just random." Or when she said, when, "When you mean purposefully, too, you mean um, like it's like your you, reason you, in the, story. In the you and want it's to some, elicit a certain reaction." Yeah, and if, and in order to elicit that certain reaction, you have to know why the trope in, yes. exists in the first. So, place. what a reader is expecting. What do you want to happen when you subvert it? Um, what will you see as a successful reaction in readers? What will you see as, oh, I maybe should have done that in the readers? You need to really know what you're going for to attempt that kind of thing. But kudos to you, it's difficult. <laughs> yes, start by studying. Yeah. How do you manage satis satisfaction in a sad ending? What if you're not looking for a happy ending? Yes. Is it, okay, so... Sometimes it can be the most satisfying. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sometimes sad endings can be so aesthetic yes. and so beautiful. beautiful. But the point, the satisfaction point isn't them getting together. It has to be about some other sort of fulfillment. Yes. Like, or maybe, or maybe they had a great love but for tragic reasons, they yes. can't be together. So you have, you still have to land the satisfaction point with their love or else readers don't care. And you need, I like seeing that they still have thought about each other, that they still hold a beautiful memory for each other, even in these sad, tragic times. Yeah. It can be, it can be, it's just as powerful. Because the tragedy is, isn't is like, oh, these two shouldn't be together, whatever. That's a happy ending, actually. <laughs> yeah, it should be like, these two are meant for each They're other. Soulmates. They are soulmates. They should be together. And they can't. Yeah. They oh. just can't. And oh, it's, that is a beautiful yearning. Yeah. Okay. I hope that helps. All right. <laughs> a tricky one. Um, how do you write an inexperienced bottom into a very confident borderline slutty one? Do you have any <laughs> tips for this? I want to make it realistic. 
Oh, how do you go from being shy to being super like slutty? He has to have experience. He has to have really positive experience. Very positive experience. And it can't just be from like he, it has to be something that he will want for himself. It's not something that's forced into him. Like a sort of awakened awakening, curiosity. Sexual awakening. Which are amazing stories. I love sexual awakening yeah. stories. So for through some experience, something is awakened in him that drives that sort of path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It needs to be coming from within the character. It's not necessarily what's being done to the character. It's about what the how the character reacts to those experiences. And he realizes different. something within himself. It yeah. definitely, and it has to be his choice. Yeah, yeah. That's what will make it realistic when everything inside the character is internally consistent, and you, the readers get it and are empathizing with parts. That's how you know you've you've landed it. All right. We got a five minute warning. Okay, got, sorry. Got, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's time for one more. Yeah. Can you or take two. one more? One or two more? We'll see. I'm trying to pick a good one. So many. Yeah. <laughs> so many questions. You guys are great. Thanks for being so engaged. And we should teach a class. <laughs> like, what do you do when the boyfriend by oh sorry? What do you do when the boyfriend by plot has to be loyal to another guy? How do you ensure the main pair is still understood at the, as the main pair despite this? Uh, when we got rival characters getting involved here. They have to be so you have to show that he's not into the other guy. Yeah. You, uh, so no, no, that's a delicious sort of readers, plot. It's a difficult one to hit with readers, right? If they feel like the main character is like a home record or something. Cheating, yeah. They, so you need to balance the emotions and um, where they're at really pinpoint. You want to put yourself on the foot of your, in the shoes of your reader and be like, how would they perceive this? You got to like going, not knowing that the MC is a good guy or whatever, or that the, the eventual boyfriend is going to be a good guy. You need to make sure that for a, someone who has no idea where the story is going, that they're following along. Yeah. There's also ways to show that the relationship that they're stuck in is not right for them. Yeah. And you want to, you also, you show the characters you're writing. You show them thinking about each other. You show like stole, maybe stolen moments. It's actually quite a, can be quite a delicious Yeah, because there are lots yeah. of re lots of people who um, unfortunately experience relationships, but they're not, you know, they fall out of love with the person that they're in, but they're still in the relationships for, I don't know, various character flaw reasons which is, you can put in your story and it's realistic. And I think people would really jive with that as long as you write it with the reader reaction in mind. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for one more question. How did you, I got a couple that I'm throwing in together into one mash of a question. How did you get started in manga and what would you recommend like for someone who wants to get started in publishing manga? How, how do you get started? Where did you guys meet? How did you get going? What would you <laughs> You should well, tell you, uh, in, writers. Yeah, we started in, in fandom. That's how we met. I was an artist in fandom, and Michi was a writer in fandom. And then we sort of had this idea for an original. This was years ago, an original story, and we posted it on Tapas, and oh. um, it was got in the fields, which is like our first ever time. Uh, doing an original comic together. But it was a, still kind of fan, <laughs> fan was, material because yeah. it was based on Hades and Persephone. We weren't, we weren't as good at, as the things we've just told you about. <laughs> mm. So, um, but what happened was that the site we posted Gone in the Field on um, was doing sort of a, like a search. Like a, like a pitch contest. Yeah. And they wanted us to apply. So we applied with Born Sexy Tomorrow and they accepted us as one of 20 like sort of incubated comics. Yeah. And, and they paid us to make the comic. Yes. But um, there's lots of ways to get started these days with indie publishing. I would say if you want to get started, this is a better time than ever. Yeah. So People are so post on a hungry web for content. Post on a webcomic site. Yeah. Start building an audience. You can always, you can make a Patreon. If you get fans, you can fund the book print. Um, but first of all, you have to write the story. Yes. So you write your story, say you've got your story and you love it and you want to turn it into a comic. You want to be posting it on every single free web comic site on a schedule for people to sort of like go and go and check out. And then once you've gotten um, a really good following and they're like, oh, how can we help support you or whatever, that's when you open like your Patreon or your coffee and you start having people help you that way. And I then if you get a certain number of pages and you have a certain number of um, readers, I always say, this is my math thing, but 1% of your readership will, 1% to 10% of your loyal readership is going to want to buy a print copy of what they're reading. So if you got, if you can get around 200, like, of that loyal readership, 
that can fund a pretty affordable book print that will like let you get your comics into print. If you want to work with companies, you want to get that number up regardless. Because yeah. they only start paying attention to you when you've got like a decent number of followers. Yes. Unfortunately, they don't care about anything else really. <laughs> <laughs> it's just do you have the numbers and the readership and then they'll offer you paid things. I think there is what yeah. I'll say is there's a big good amount of things to stay independent so you're in complete control of your property yeah <laughs> we did do a creators panel last year i think it, it was uh recorded for fujicon so you we actually talk more about the creation process so, there yeah and like the publishing process there and i think at fujicon this year on the schedule has someone who's doing a webtoon i don't know if she's a professional webtoon artist but she does also she's doing a whole panel about webtoon creation yeah if you want to go to that panel yeah because our, our i know our story was a bit more atypical so yeah yeah so um oh final final thoughts as we wrap up to two plugs oh yeah if you still feel bad about liking bl or reading what you like or or problematic tropes you should come to my bl destigmatization panel on sunday which is fujo is not a four-letter word and i think it's one of the last panels that's of the such time. a good title yeah fujo is not it's okay to be a fujo and i will reassure you about why it's okay to make what you like yes and the second thing is we are actually doing a Kickstarter for a print version of Born Sexy Tomorrow. Which was that comic that got our first professional foot in the door. Yeah, and it is launching on Monday. Yeah. And we'd love it if you guys want to go just go. Um, I dropped the link in the chat. Yeah, if you guys want to go click on the link, just follow the project because it's going to be launching on Monday. And it'll be very exciting. And we would really appreciate the support. You can check out our works on our website, vvbgcomics.com, and we hope to hear from you guys. vvg-comics.com. Oh, just not the regular one does not work anymore. Well, I guess they both work. <laughs> Either one. <laughs> Either one. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You guys thank were you guys. wonderful. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you, our audience, for your lovely questions, and hope to see you at future uh, FujoCon events. Have a great night. Be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.